It is now 6.30, and you're telling me to start. Okay. Uh, I am respecting the timekeeper, Jim Epstein, who is in charge of uh, the live streaming. Welcome to this ninth debate of the second season of the SOA Forum, both to those in our physical audience at the Subculture Theater in downtown Manhattan and to the thousands around the globe who are watching us on live streaming. I'm Gene Epstein, director of the SOHO Forum. We're a monthly debate series that features topics of special interest to libertarians and aims to enhance social and professional ties within New York City's libertarian community. We're partnered with Reason Magazine in presenting these debates, and you can catch audio of all our events on the Reason podcast, which you'll find in the iTunes store. This is an Oxford-style debate in which the audience initially votes for, against, are undecided on the resolution, and then again after the debate is over. Whoever moves the vote in his or her favor is declared the winner. Go into SohoVote.com to cast your initial vote. You'll find that tonight's resolution reads, all government support of higher education should be abolished. Jane Menton, please come to the stage and explain the voting procedure. Hello. Um, so to vote, you'll need to log into the subculture Wi-Fi. The username is sub C underscore guest, and the password is enjoy welcome, all one word, all lowercase. And then go to SohoVote.com, where you can vote yes, no, or undecide on the resolution. It's SohoVote.com, and your vote will only count if you vote both before and after the debate. And we want every vote to count, so go vote. Thank you, Jane. Now, with every uh, now, thanks most of all to the Smith Family Foundation for making this series possible. For more information and to buy tickets to our future debates, go to our website at thesoloforum.org. Now, with every solo forum, uh, we have a warm-up act, and this evening we are pleased to bring back Dave Smith, who runs the great podcast Part of the Problem. Dave, please come to the stage and warm us up. Oh, hello. Why, thank you. Okay. How are we? Got about a big round of applause for Gene Epstein, uh, who's the reason we're all here at this wonderful debate series. As the world falls apart, we debate the issues only we care about. And it's a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful time. Should, what, what's the resolution? Should government funding of higher education be abolished? You had me at government and abolished. I am way on board. Why would I not want to be robbed to train the next generations of commies? I don't know. It's just, aren't college kids just the worst? Maybe I'm just, maybe I'm just getting old. But they, they just, they hate everything that's good in the world, like capitalism and white people. Like, what's the, di why can't you just appreciate a good thing when it's right in front of you? I don't know. Maybe that's a microaggression, um, I'm, not, I'm not sure, I don't know. I mean, we have been subsidizing college for a long time and it's, it's worked out pretty well. We, uh, we elected the brilliant Donald Trump, so clearly this nation knows a thing or two. All right, one Trump supporter out there. <laughs> college is such a goddamn ripoff that Donald Trump was like, I have to get in on that, and he started his own university where you will probably learn more than you will at the average college. <laughs> at least you know to put your name on the side of a building or something, I don't know. Donald Trump is president. I'm still, I'm still blown away by it. It doesn't matter how long, I, st I turn on the news every day just to make sure Trump is still president. I just need five minutes and I'm like, okay, we're still doing it and then I go back. Do you guys, I, I'm a kid, I grew up in like the 80s and, and 90s and Bill Cosby was the epitome of success. He was the biggest comedian in the country. His nickname was America's Father. And now Bill Cosby is like an old blind rapist. And Donald Trump is president. <laughs> Could you imagine if you were in a coma for 20 years? And then you came out of it and they're like, so catch me up. Like what's been going on since? I've been gone, and they're like, all right, sit down. I mean, you're probably already laying down, but stay laying down. 
And you're like, so Cosby's a rapist and Trump is president. And you'd be like, clearly I'm still in this coma. So like, I'm just going <laughs> to chill out here. I don't know. Is college a good thing? I, I don't know. I mean, I come, like my family is, uh, they're academics. Like my mother is a PhD uh, and my, my sister has a PhD. I dropped out and I'm more successful than all those losers. So I don't really know. I don't know what to say. They've never been on TV, either of them. Like, they haven't done anything. My, my little brother is, uh, he's from like my mother's second marriage. He's much younger than me. He's graduating college next month. Uh, or actually, I think, actually this month, three weeks. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'm, I, I guess I'm gonna stop by. Uh, but I don't, <laughs> I hate college graduations. Have you been, why are they so religious? You guys are both professors. Why do, they, why do you dress up in the goofy robes and stuff? Like, why does, it have to, why does Muammar Gaddafi have to give the diploma to uh, the students? He's always got to sing a song and then participate in this whole dance. And I don't know, I just. It's like Halloween. Thank you. It is, exactly. <laughs> kind of like Halloween, except for $60,000 a year. It's a very, very expensive Halloween. Also, by the way, college, for like 90% of it, is just a place to get drunk after high school. I don't know if you guys have been to college campuses lately, but that's all it is. I'll t when I went to college, uh, the first, you know they have like the, um, it's like the, the, when you get there, there's like a week before class starts. And that's just, yeah, it's like orientation week and everyone just gets hammered. I went out the first night I was at college. I was like, oh, the intellectual adventure begins. <laughs> and I came back and there were three stretchers outside my dorm room because kids had just drank themselves to half near death. Because they were the losers who weren't getting drunk in high school like me. Like I had already developed a tolerance by that point. And every, uh, you know, there, there was this one kid, I remember, here's the taste of college for you, okay? Just the average college experience. So there was this kid, this, is, uh, this was day three. So still no classes, but day three of orientation week. And I, I, started, I became friendly with this one kid, Greg, and then there was this one weird kid, John, who just kind of kept following us around. And uh, he was like a, a rich kid, like a party animal. Uh, we, we nicknamed him Cokehead John. Uh, we weren't that creative, but you can see why he got the nickname. And uh, he was just a maniac, and he would just wouldn't leave us. Like, he was always by our side, and we were like, fuck, Cokehead John. And so he, so this, this like, three cars pulled up in front of our dorm of like town kids. I don't even think they went to the college, but they were just like these kind of tough kids. And they, they pulled up and then they went into the dorm and then Cokehead John looked at me and Greg and he goes, watch this, this is gonna be hilarious. And he goes over and started peeing on one of the cars. And I was like, this shouldn't be college right now. Like none of this should be happening. And then, the kids came back out, like, way quickly. I don't know if they were just dropping off drugs at the dorm, but they came out very quickly. Like, they didn't hang out with anyone. And they came out, and they go, hey, who peed on my car? You know, as a reasonable reaction. <laughs> and, uh, and Cokehead John looked at me, and he goes, you got my back, right? And I was like, no, not at all. I absolutely don't have, I've known you for three days, and I don't even like you that much. <laughs> and then I... I was just like, no, and then these kids just beat up Cokehead John, and you know, I didn't catch his back at all, but I, I, I gave a few like, he's had enough, you know, like from the distance, or just like, he's had a, like, and then they look at me, and I'm like, no, 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 keep kicking him, I don't know, whatever, you know, whatever you gotta do, you gotta do, like, I kicked him once, yeah, screw him, I don't, and then, uh, and then they got in their car and they drove off, uh, like, I guess they were like, we just beat someone up, we should leave, they had good sense, and then he got up and he started screaming at us. And he was like, why didn't you have my back back there? And I was like, why did you piss on their car? Like, what a ridiculous thing to do. And then he went in, this is all true, okay? I haven't taken one class yet. This is my college experience. And he went in uh, inside the dorm and he got a knife and he came back out with his knife. And I was like, are you just determined to make this worse for yourself? Like what? And, and he, he got out a knife, and he was like, where are those kids? And I was like, they, they drove away, they're gone. Take the loss, you know what I mean? And, uh, and then someone else came up to him, some other guy who I didn't know, and he didn't know, 
And he goes, hey, dude, what are you doing with the knife? And he goes, back off or I'll stab you. <laughs> and, and to which the gentleman replied to him, he said, I'm your RA. <laughs> I'll never forget that line as long as I live. He said, I'm your RA. And John just went, oh, sorry. <laughs> and just a life lesson for you kids out there. Sorry doesn't cover, I'm going to stab you. Like, it doesn't, it doesn't make that have not happened in the past. It's not like you could be like, back off or I'll stab you, and then go, sorry, and you go, we're good. No problem. Like, we're, we're totally square. Um, so, yeah. Uh, Cokehead John got kicked out of school the next day. He got kicked out before one class. He hadn't even heard, like, welcome to, you know, whatever 101. Didn't even get that far. He just got kicked out. And uh, that was the last I ever saw Cokehead John. But my other friend, Greg, who I'm still friends with to this day, uh, he did break into Cokehead John's dorm and steal his guitar. <laughs> I guess the kid had a sweet electric guitar. And then he pawned it. And, uh, and, and he bought me weed for like a week with the, <laughs> with the money from that guitar. So like it has a happy ending is my point, all right? <laughs> Enjoy the debate, everybody. Thank you very much, Gene Epstein. <laughs> Dave Smith, uh, watch it, listen to his podcast, Part of the Problem, I'm a, a devotee. Well, uh, now for the uh, main event, uh, arguing for the affirmative on the resolution, we have economist Brian Kaplan. Brian, please come to the stage. Uh, after the debate, um, let me take, uh, take the floor to here, Brian. And after the debate, uh, Brian will be doing book signing and sales for his book, The Case Against Education, Why the Education System is a Waste of Time and Money. Opposing the resolution, we have economist Ed Glazer. Ed, Please come to the stage. With, uh, with regrets, Ed Glazer has promises to keep back home early tomorrow morning, so he'll have to leave us immediately after the debate ends to take a car to the airport. Uh, so that's unfortunate, but Brian's going to be sticking around to sign books and to answer your questions. We now close the voting. Please take the podium uh, and uh, defend the resolution. All government support of higher education should be abolished. Take it away, Brian. Thank you. Uh, so why should higher education receive government support? There are two main arguments. Uh, the first is the economic argument. Uh, government support is allegedly economically beneficial, not merely for individual students, but for society as a whole. Uh, the second is the humanistic argument. Economic effects aside, government support is vital for the promotion of intrinsically valuable ideas, culture, and values. Uh, if I merely supported spending cuts, I'd only need to argue that the economic and humanistic arguments are overstated, uh, since I'm advocating full separation of college and state. However, I've got to go further, and I do. Uh, my book, uh, The Case Against Education, maintains that both the economic and humanistic arguments are deeply wrong. Uh, Economically speaking, subsidizing higher education is like subsidizing polluting industries. It's probably good that these industries exist, but the market tends to provide too much of them, not too little. Uh, the humanistic argument is similarly flimsy. While I do share the humanist ideals, higher education simply isn't very persuasive or transformative. The vast majority of college students arrive as Philistines, as our stand-up comedian did, and leave as Philistines. I'll uh, leave that up to you. Uh, <laughs> Now, uh, since Ed and I are both economists, I'm going to focus on the economic, ar economic argument. Uh, the standard story says that college is a great place to build human capital. Uh, professors supposedly spend four years pouring useful job skills into their students. Why should we believe this? Well, because college graduates out-earn high school graduates by over 70%. Employers aren't stupid. If college didn't build tons of human capital, why on earth would the labor market shower these rewards on college grads? This is a very convincing story, until you remember what college professors actually teach. Uh, sure, there are a few majors that regularly prepare their students for the world of work, like engineering and computer science, but most of what college students study is simply irrelevant in the labor market. 
In real life, how often do you use history, government, literature, foreign languages, psychology, philosophy, or higher mathematics? By and large, students can safely forget such materials after the final exam because it never comes up again as long as they live. And forget it, they do. Uh, these observations are so obvious, you might wonder how anyone could deny them. Uh, well, just think about your own educational experience. How many thousands of hours did you spend studying foreseeably useless material? Economist standard response is simply to double back to the labor market. If college coursework were largely irrelevant in real life, real life employers wouldn't pay college graduates a handsome premium. Uh, strangely though, there's a Nobel Prize winning economic model that explains why even the most irrelevant education and even the, most, and even the silliest majors can be financially rewarding. It's called signaling. Basic idea, academic success is a great way to convince employers that you've got the right stuff to show off your brains, your work ethic, and your sheep-like conformity. Uh, since people with these traits are productive workers, employers happily reward people who display them, even if the display has nothing to do with the job. Uh, think about it like this. There's two distinct ways to raise the value of a diamond. The first is to give it to a gemsmith to cut the diamond to perfection. The second is to give it to an appraiser to attest to its flawlessness. The first story is like human capital. The second story is like signaling. Now, what difference does the mechanism make? Uh, for the individual student, not much. For society, however, it makes all the difference in the world. Insofar as the human capital model is right, government support for college enriches society as a whole by upgrading the skills of the workforce. Insofar as the signaling model is right, however, government support for college impoverishes society by sparking a wasteful credentialist arms race. So which model is right, human capital or signaling? Uh, the truth is obviously a mixture of both. Uh, in the case against education, however, I agree that signaling share of the mix exceeds half and probably a lot more. So why should you agree with me? Uh, for starters, look at the curriculum. Most of what we teach in college is so otherworldly that you're only likely to use it on the job if you become a college professor yourself. No sane person in a non-economic job panics because they've forgotten about what, everything the professors taught them about history, literature, or philosophy. Now, curriculum aside, you probably already agree with me. Uh, did you bother to enroll in college or pay tuition? If all you wanted was the learning, this was a total waste because you can unofficially take classes for free at virtually any college in America. There's just one little problem. At the end of four years of guerrilla education, you won't have the crucial signal, the diploma. As a result, unofficial education barely exists. Uh, suppose you could have a Princeton education without the diploma or a Princeton diploma without the education. Which would you choose? Uh, if you have to ponder, you already agree with me. <laughs> right? You already believe in the power of signaling. By contrast, if you were stand on, stand, stranded on an island and you had to choose between knowledge of boat building and having a boat building degree, you wouldn't ponder. <laughs> uh, when you face the labor market, it's important to be impressive. When you, uh, when you face the ocean, all that matters is skill. Uh, signaling dominates if you look at the way college students approach their studies. They routinely seek out easy A's, professors who dole out strong signals in exchange for little work. Of course, you don't learn very much from such professors, but who cares? After the final exam, you'll never need to know it again. Signaling likewise explains why academic cheating is not only cheating yourself. When you impersonate a good student, you hurt employers who hire you, and the honest students whose merits you indirectly call into question. Uh, academic research reinforces common sense. Uh, while economists typically measure education's annual return, scholars who look find enormous diploma or sheepskin effects. A senior year pays far more than the first three years of college combined. This is very hard for human capital theory to explain. It makes perfect sense that college students are trying to signal their conformity by completing their degree. Uh, Macroeconomists, too, have found that while individual education is big effect, has a big effect on individual income, national education only has a very small effect on national income. Uh, now, to be fair, they rarely embrace the signaling explanation. Instead, they usually cry for better data so we can get the right result. All right. Uh, but signaling does clearly explain the results that they've got. If one laborer gets more relevant education, he outshines the competition. But if a whole labor force gets more relevant education, society's time and money go down the drain. Uh, given the small effect of education on GDP, it's hardly surprising that few researchers find that education leads to higher GDP growth. If you're still trying to figure out if your machine moves at all, you probably do not have a perpetual motion machine. 
Uh, now, the most striking academic evidence for signaling, though, comes from literature on credential inflation. The average worker today is years more educated than he used to be. How much of this is because jobs are more cognitively demanding? How much of this is because workers now need more education to get, though not do, a given job? Uh, in the case against education, I go over all the main studies. Uh, punchline, the evolving labor market explains only about 20% of the rise in education. The remaining 80% is credential inflation. Right? You need college to convince today's employers to give you the same jobs that your parents or grandparents got right out of high school. Uh, this is puzzling for human capital theory. Why should employers pay for BAs when you, only, when you need only a high school education to do the job? But signaling explains it very elegantly. The more degrees proliferate, the more you need to stand out. Uh, when I present these arguments, economists rarely deny that signaling seems like a persuasive story. Instead, they usually retreat to a priori objections. I'm sure Ed won't, but the other bad one, the bad ones too. All right, and they're almost all bad. No. All right, so they almost all retreat to, uh, to a priori objections. Appearances notwithstanding, signaling just can't be right. Uh, the most popular objection is just that college passes the market test. If it were mostly signaling, I've heard so many people tell me, someone would have figured out a cheaper signal long ago. But this is just crazy. Higher education receives hundreds of billions of dollars a year of taxpayer support. This is a classic sign that an industry fails the market test. Right? There are probably plenty of socially cheaper forms of labor market signaling, but as long as these massive subsidies continue, the substitutes will probably remain on the fringes. The easiest way to discover the good alternatives is to end government support for higher ed and see what comes next. Now, at this point, you could respond, all right, sure, education's mostly signaling, but the economic rewards are so great that it's still worth subsidizing. Uh, but signaling aside, there's, all, there, there's still far less to education's economic rewards than meets the eye. Uh, why? First, uh, college graduates are not randomly selected. Most were already high performers back in high school. If, so if they hadn't gone to college, they probably would have been fairly successful anyway. When researchers statistically compare high school graduates to college graduates with equal pre-college ability, they almost always find that the true effect on college on career success is a lot smaller than it looks. Uh, second, standard comparisons focus on people who actually finish their degrees, but this is totally cheating, right? The college graduation for full-time students is about 50%. When you weigh college and investment, correcting for this slashes the expected return once again. Now, a debate is admittedly not a good place to do arithmetic, uh, so I'll just say, read the book, and of course, buy the book first. Uh, so in the case against education, I snap all these pieces and many others together. Right? So and along the way, I seriously study potentially neglected benefits of college. So health, crime, you name it. Uh, because confirmation bias is bad. All right, now final result. From a social point of view, investments in college aren't just overrated, they're ruinous. Subsidizing this rat race is as economically foolish as handing out big, ca big cash prizes to the world's dirtiest polluters. Uh, when the economic case for tax subsidized college crumbles, even many economists suddenly discover the finer things in life. What about the humanistic argument that college inspires love of ideas and culture that refines and elevates us? Uh, my quick response, a refinement and elevation would be great if it really happened, <laughs> but the actual data say this is mostly, mostly wishful thinking. Only a minuscule fraction of college grads take a meaningful interest in ideas or culture after graduation. People who attend events like the Soho Forum for fun are really weird. <laughs> <laughs> and, that, <laughs> and that is why I love you guys. All right, now you could agree with every word I said so far, but respond, instead of abolishing government support for higher education, government should use the power purse to fix higher education. We can certainly imagine a world where colleges fill every student's mind with human capital and every student's heart with Shakespeare, so why not do that? Uh, simple. Defunding dysfunctional systems is almost foolproof. Fixing dysfunctional systems, in contrast, is horribly hard. As a professor, I assure you the entire system bitterly resists even mild reforms. Most professors detest the very idea of objectively measuring the value of anything they do. They're artists. You can't deal with these people, and it's foolish to try. Uh, if someone says, you know, sorry for wasting trillions of tax dollars, but we did a few good things, and we'll spend your money wisely from now on, the prudent reaction is to draw a line in the sand and just say, you're fired. Uh, but why should we so extreme? Uh, you know, so why not just cut half and, and uh, see if that does the trick? 
So pragmatically speaking, abolition is just a lot more transparent. Uh, the scope of partial reforms is always confusing and debatable. When you separate college and state, you know it. Uh, since this is the SOHO Forum, though, uh, let me end with my principled argument for full abolition, the presumption of liberty. I know there's a wide range of libertarian views. In fact, there is one libertarian view per libertarian. Uh, <laughs> but we should all be able to agree that the burden of proof rests on the advocates of government intervention. If politicians are going to take our money without our consent, they should at least have solid proof the money is very well spent. Government support for college does not meet that bar, not even close. Thank you. Ed, Ed Glazer for the negative. Take it away, Ed. Thank you, and I'm really grateful, Gene, that you brought together a really wide ideological perspective, really running from A to B all, all the way, because, because I favor cutting all spending on education except for one guy who's really deserving, who, de who should get a Pell Grant. So, so we're other, th other than that, we're... Uh, um, no, I mean, it, it's, there's a lot of truth in what Brian said, and there's a, a great public service that he has done in poking holes in the educational establishment. Um, I do think, as in many cases, the need is at least as much for reform as simply cutting spending. But I agree with Brian that, that reform is hard. But when I look at all the universe of crazy things that the government does, the combination of Pell Grants and a certain amount of, of university-based research funding, NIH, some NSF funding, these are by far, these aren't the Detroit People Mover monorail, okay? These are, these are much better, more socially productive things than those. So when I, when I think about going through things, this is not the first place that I would massively take an ax to, but still, some ax cutting would be appropriate. Now, the biggest factual disagreement that Brian and I have is on the statement, and you heard him make it, that cross-nationally, there's no relationship between schooling and earnings. Uh, I just can't see how that comes out of the data. And let me just give you a few facts on this. When you look across countries and you compare the top quarter by years of schooling of countries with the bottom quarter, the top quarter has average earnings of $34,000. The bottom quarter has average earnings of $1,200. In fact, there are very few social science facts as well established as the fact that well-educated countries have vastly higher productivity than poorly educated countries. A typical estimate is that an extra year of schooling at the country level is associated with 42% more productivity at the country level, which is not less than the individual earnings, but four times those individual earnings. And the correlation coefficient across countries between earnings and education is a whopping 78%. Now, if you did this in growth, so look at change in education and change in earnings, um, you take the top quarter in terms of growth in education, that had an average per capita growth in earnings of 474%. The bottom quarter between 1960 and 2010. The bottom quarter, growth of 125%, so almost fourfold growth difference. Year on year, the year to, to year earnings, uh, every extra year of growth that you had, an extra 32% in terms of, of earnings, so triple the individual uh, earnings number. Um, now, n if you take just 1960 schooling and look at subsequent growth, the top quarter in terms of schooling, 388% average income growth. The bottom quarter, 23% average er earnings growth. So uh, Brian has numbers like, you know, one typical estimate is that a year of schooling boosts national income by from 1.3 to 1.7%. Now, Brian, I love you, but those numbers aren't even typical of the table you took them from, right? Because, in fact, the other three numbers in that table are 6.6, 6.9, and 8.3%, which are between five and six times the numbers that you actually cite on this. So the... the it's not that there isn't a macro literature that is interested in what schooling does to total factor productivity growth. And that literature, as Brian correctly states, is deeply mixed. But total factor productivity growth is essentially GDP already controlling for the direct effect of schooling, which is understood to be quite significant uh, and positive. Now, Brian correctly then says, well, if you did find a positive effect, and of course you do, and it's huge, you could then say, well, maybe that's reverse causality, and maybe it is. Right? Quite possibly. But when we look at whether or not income in 1960 predicts schooling growth, right, the answer is it doesn't, whereas schooling in 1960 whoppingly predicts income growth subsequently. So it's not that I think this makes the case for the current educational establishment nonsense, but you know, it's very hard to look at that and say to yourself that this is obviously the winner for, for signaling. And certainly, you know, for example, the claim that he makes on page 122 that, that you know, uh, the fact that individual schooling has such a higher return uh, than national schooling, 
given that I think the direct evidence shows exactly the opposite, far from suggesting that signaling wins this round, I think signaling loses uh, based on, on the, the massively higher macro estimate. Those macro estimates are also larger when you look at the metro area level rather than the, the individual level. So typically when economists look at metro area relationships between schooling and uh, area income or success, they're pretty large effects. One year of, of one extra percentage point or 10 extra percentage points of, of adults with a college degree are associated with about 15% higher median earnings at the metro area level. The typical human capital estimates are that a 10% increase in the share of the population with a college degree in your metro area is associated with 10% higher earnings for you holding your years of schooling constant. And that's from the work of Enrico Moretti. Or if you wanted to compare population growth between 1960 and, and 2010 for the most educated quarter versus the least educated quarter of America's cities, 117% population growth for the most educated, 60% for the least educated. Another way of making this real is if you want to think to yourself, do we understand why why Seattle and Detroit look different when they, in the 1970s they both looked like declining industrial towns and two jokers in 1971 put up a billboard on the highway leaving Seattle asking the last person to leave the city to please turn out the lights. You know, because you know, no one could imagine a Seattle with a smaller, smaller Boeing and, and Boeing had been cutting back on jobs before Amazon, Costco, Microsoft, Starbucks, right? The difference is completely explained by the education level of the, of the residents of these two cities. They're both exactly on the regression line. More than 50% of Seattle's adults have college degrees, about one in eight of Detroit's adults have college degrees. Now, um, this doesn't mean that I don't believe in signaling. I think a lot of the sheepskin effect is, is signaling, absolutely. Uh, and I think it's true that labor economists have underestimated signaling. I think Brian is exactly right on that. I do think the sheepskin effect does probably have some just straight ability bias as well. I mean, you know, the kid who wastes four years of his parents' savings going to NYU and then doesn't bother to show up for the degree, right? There's something wrong with that kid, okay? You know, on top of the fact that it's like dad's chasing him with a whip too or something like that. Um, now, when we actually ask ourselves what, what is, so this is all at a very high level, as indeed Brian's discussion is, and notice I'm not even dignifying the humanist argument with response, so I want, I want that. I want that noted. Um, in part, just to be clear, it's not that I don't believe in the up uplifting values of, of certain types of education, but if something does uplift the soul, I want the government as far away from it as possible, okay? So it's, it's far from... Um, um, now, what are the three possible you know, justifications that I think are reasonable? The first is spillovers, the public good nature of knowledge. Okay, um, so uh, for 25 years, Paul Milgram has been helping the FCC design spectrum auctions. Most recently, the incentive auction, uh, which Paul designed based on NSF-supported research, involved essentially a trade of spectrum. So no public stuff was given away. It's a trade of spectrum from broadcast uh, broadcaster to mobile uh, broadband providers that netted nine billion dollars for the U.S. government just by a well-designed auction. Right, that nine billion dollars that covers the entire expenditure of econ research by the NSF since the dawn of time, okay? So it's, it, this is a small thing, and there are people, believe it or not, in non-economics fields who also think their research has social value added, like these medical guys. Uh, the, uh, uh, so I, I think there's a reasonable view for some limited public supporting of research in core areas. Two, um, the area of Pell Grants, community colleges, area of support for the most dis disadvantaged Americans, in which we are not fundamentally making the case based on externalities or inefficiencies. We're making the case on social justice. Um, I don't know a better way of trying to support poor kids other than trying to get them somewhat better, better schooling. Now, it is true that our current schooling products are failing our kids. It is absolutely right that Brian is arguing for better vocational training. And indeed, that's the hope that community colleges can be doing a better job on this. And remember, more than 50% of Pell Grants are going to private universities, which are at least are allegedly claiming to be delivering some degree of, of usable skills. But I just have absolutely no trouble when I think about all the ways the government tries to redistribute money to try and make America a uh, more equitable place, or even more importantly, right, given that I care far more about equality of opportunity than I do about equality of outcomes, a place in which, which kids from poor backgrounds can find some degree of, of possibility, I, I just have no problem with the idea that we're going to have some limited public support for schooling for poor children. It just doesn't, it just doesn't bother me at all, and I think it's a totally reasonable thing for the, for the government to be doing. Now, you can tell me that we want to rethink the Pell Grant program. You can tell me that we want to rethink school loans. You can tell me that you want to rethink the way that community colleges operate. I'm 100% with you. 
okay? But I'm not in a place that says that I want to get rid of all of public support for poorer kids to get, to get more education. I just, I'm not there, and I'm not going to be there, quite honestly. I think that that's something that, that makes America, that the very idea of that makes America something of a better place. Um, Remember, the, the Pell Grants, two-thirds of unmarried uh, undergraduates with, with kids are receiving Pell Grants. So these are people who are going through somewhat of a tough life, and it's not a terrible thing that they're getting a bit of, a bit of support. Um, third, this is, the, this is the hard, oh, just one point on, on Pell Grants. So one of the things that I think is, is attractive about the idea of keeping some degree of federal support is we can make greater demands of the community colleges if we keep some federal funding in the, in the game. So if we make Pell Grant payments conditional upon employment for the people who receive the education, this can provide stronger incentives for the schools to provide it. We can actually, in some sense, use some degree of federal engagement to, to block it, to, to push them towards a more productive space. Finally, I have some sympathy, and this relates to the facts with which I began this, to Thomas Jefferson's line that if a nation expects to be ignorant and free in a state of civilization, it expects what never was and never will be. Now, I don't know the extent to which this necessarily calls for the large and bloated federal education infrastructure that we currently have. But somehow or other, the idea of turning our back on higher education from the public sphere doesn't sound entirely right to me either. That I would have guessed that if we're going to get a nation that is smarter, that is better educated, that is more functional, uh, that almost assuredly this will require some version of using everything that we have. Now, this requires above all parents Right? And it requires communities, and it requires people like Brian to yell and scream at the skies and say what's so bloody wrong about all this and why you're teaching junk to our, our kids and why nobody is learning. All this is 100% true. But I think the end of the day, you're still going to want some degree of national public support for schools, for, for education. So uh, let, me, let me just wrap it up there, which is when I look at communities along many different dimensions, corruption, right? there's a strong negative connection correlation between education and corruption. When we look at you know, the, the misery, the opioid abuse that occurs in the eastern heartland of the US, where joblessness is extreme, all of these places are places which are enormously sparse on education. I see very few things at the community level that do better when there are sh fewer college graduates. And as a result, if I thought about all the stupid things that the federal government does, why is this the one that I would center on first to gut relative to, I don't know, people move on monorails or highways and bridges to nowhere or any number of the, of the crazy things that the government does. So um, let me just end there and just say, you know, I'm grateful for Brian's book. I, I am grateful that we're having this debate. I, I think that there is much to be uh, sought in terms of education reform. But I do think that, by and large, the right answer is not to give up on education, not even to give up on some public support of education, that indeed both as a tool for funding knowledge creation and as a tool for allowing some degree of economic opportunity, and in some sense to make sure the glue of the nation sticks together, some degree of intervention, even if it is just one Pell Grant for one guy in Cleveland, right? some degree of public intervention makes sense. Thank you. Uh, rebuttal from Brian. You, you might want to you take the uh, podium. Uh, Brian gets a rebuttal, and then Ed gets a rebuttal. Then we go to questions. Uh, so great pleasure to debate with Ed, because uh, his arguments are different from those of any of the other critics. Uh, <laughs> so uh, the most technical one is one where really you do need to read the book to uh, decide for yourself. But this is on the question of, is the national payoff for education greater than, equal to, or smaller than the individual payoff? All I can say here is that when I started writing the book, I thought I was going to have to deal with the stuff that Ed so hold you. And then when I actually read the paper, I said, oh, wow, actually, they already agree with me. So this is much easier than I was expecting. I think, you know, so again, the, you know, the stuff that Ed was saying, I don't think is so much wrong as just the people who actually do the research would never do such a simple comparison. Instead, they would go and say, well, let's go and adjust for a few other things. And after they adjust for a few other things, that's where they have the trouble finding any noticeable effect of education. And again, so that's one where I just encourage you to read the book. That's the best place to resolve it. Hard to do it here. Uh, let's see. Uh, no, I don't see. And then, let's see here. Uh, yeah, so why don't we just go over Ed's top three arguments for continuing to have some government involvement. So again, first of all, you've got this uh, public goods nature of knowledge. Right? So again, this is one where I think we would agree that a great deal of the research that comes out of universities is just not very useful. Right, or is actually of negative value. 
And then it comes down to the question of, is it worth pulling the plug on it if only five or 10% of the research is actually worthwhile? And this comes down to, do we have a system that is actually capable of, dis of finding that five or 10% so accurately that, it's, that we can trust it? And this is where I just say no. Right now, furthermore, I would say that even for the research that comes out of universities that is clearly useful, there's still the question of where those researchers would have been if they weren't in universities. I say a lot of them would have ended up in the private sector and likely would have been doing things that were more useful in what they're doing. There is a standard view among academics that basic research is way more socially valuable than applied research. However, there's been a lot of research saying that's not really true and basic research doesn't go anywhere. <laughs> And it's the applied research that accomplishes almost everything. So uh, Terence Keeley has a, revi a revisionist history of science, which I think is quite compelling on these grounds. And again, just the idea that if you want to come up with something useful, you should first try to figure out something not useful and then hope that coincidentally useful stuff comes out of it just seems like a strange way to apply yourself if you're trying to find useful things. <laughs> All right, now on the question of uh, Pell Grants and social justice generally, right? Uh, this is one that weighed on me quite a bit. And this is where this argument I was giving you about credential inflation is so crucial, right? Because it's very easy to go and take a look at an individual person and see they got some government money and this allowed them to go to college and turn the life, their lives around. Uh, my best friend at Princeton came from a family so poor that they grew, that he literally built a log cabin to live in when he was a kid. All right, and I have to say, like, without all you know, this funding, well, probably Princeton was so rich they would have paid him, but anyway, but a lot of people like my friend would not have been in college. But here's the thing about, uh, that you need to do. Don't focus on individuals. Focus on the system you are creating. Right, it's true one individual is better off when they get government money, but if everybody in a generation has access to this money, this means that people are going to get a lot more education, and this means that employers jack up the expectations for how much education you need to have to be worthy of an interview. And that's the fundamental problem, right? We shouldn't be focusing on a few kids, uh, you know, very talented kids from poor families. Instead, why don't we think about the typical kid from poor families who no longer have the option of getting a good job right out of high school, right? In the old days, you did have that option. Now, wasn't that just because the technology was different? No, because the technology hasn't changed nearly enough to explain the change. The main thing that's changed is that you now need a lot more education to get any given job. It's not that, we, that so much that we have switched to more technically demanding jobs. That's true, but that's only a small part of the story. The main thing that's occurred in our society is now there's so many people with college degrees that you need a college degree to be considered worthy of being trained for a good job. Whereas in the past, a high school degree would have been fine. All right, so I see in terms of social justice, I think that while it's you know, very intuitively plausible to think that government funding is supporting it, if we think about all of the opportunities that we have lost, it's a different story. And again, if you think about kids in towns where a lot of people are addicted to, uh, addicted to opioids, maybe if they could get good jobs right out of high school, things would look better for them. Right? Maybe if they looked around and saw, wow, if I just finish high school, then I can get a good job. Then that would be very motivating, possibly. All right. Uh, furthermore, you know, so if you really are concerned about this as being a deep, deep problem, there is private philanthropy. Uh, Ed coming from Harvard, I know he knows about private philanthropy. Uh, there, there, there have been multiple economists who have pointed out that one of the best things to do you know, if you're from a poor family is apply to very top schools. Because in fact, places like Harvard will probably let you in for less money than George Mason would. Seriously. All right, so Caroline Hoxby has done a lot of this, and if you just get some practical advice here, Right, you know, if, if you're from a poor family, apply to the very best places because the money they have is beyond all your imagination. So, <laughs> all right, so don't think I can't go to Harvard because I'm poor. No, that's where you should go. It's the perfect place to go if you're poor. All right, now last one on uh, Jefferson, Jefferson and citizenship. This is where there is the ideal, which I strongly agree with. My first book, The Myth of Rational Voter, is all about lamenting how little Americans know about politics and economics. Uh, but here's the thing. People who go to college today still know next to nothing about this stuff. <laughs> I would love if you would make me curriculum czar and I could whip them into shape and say, you don't graduate unless you can do supply and demand, sorry. <laughs> All right, but that is not on the agenda, not even close. In fact, probably more on the agenda if there was any centralized system was you don't graduate if you do understand supply and demand. <laughs> All right. Um, so. Um, yeah, so anyway, in the book I go over all the evidence on the political effects of education, and this is, a, this is a section that actually is dissatisfying to people of almost all ideologies because here's what I say. Uh, you know how people think of universities as great left-wing indoctrination camps? They aren't. The students actually don't change their minds very much, probably because the faculty is really boring, and also they don't show up to class very much. 
All right, so put that together, the actual ideological effects of college are greatly overrated. The people that you see on TV or shared on the internet are a tiny minority of a tiny minority. They don't speak for anyone but themselves. They're not the voice of any generation, and they never will be. So it's just worth keeping that in mind. Uh, but anyway, uh, the other side, though, is that people aren't learning much good stuff either. Right, so the actual, the actual level of knowledge that college graduates have of civics or history is again so abysmally low, it's almost impossible for people at places like the Soho Forum even to imagine it. But again, you know, buy the book, read it, and see the depressing truths about how little knowledge people have. Now again, if right now we only gave people like six weeks on civics, then I think it'd be totally reasonable to try Ed's approach and let's just try harder. But if you give people three or four years of this stuff and they still don't know anything, this is where I say, look, apparently the system is just not very worthwhile. And again, remember, of course, who is going to be teaching this stuff? It's probably going to be the professors that neither Ed nor I are particularly fans of. Um, I mean, last thing, I do think it is a bit odd, given that Ed is concerned about keeping government away from anything that affects the soul, to think that government would be good at shaping citizens. What kind of citizens do you think government wants to shape, Ed? <laughs> All right. Uh, but anyway, thank you very much. And uh, as I said, privileged to debate with Ed. So the final from Ed. And of course, it is a privilege to debate with Brian as well. So um, one, I'm not, I'm not going to say anything more about the, the national education facts. Just I want to highlight that the papers that he cites are papers that were response to an overwhelming literature in the early 1990s pointing out the incredibly strong relationship between education and, and earnings and earnings growth at the nation, nation level, for which there was a backlash, which Lance Pritchett, my beloved colleague, was part of. But you know that the, the I, I think there is a broader set of papers that, that should be, should be viewed at beyond what, what was in, in there. So um, now to the important stuff. So choosing the, the three arguments that I gave, which I, I feel compelled to defend, um, one of which is choosing which, which ideas, lots of ideas are negative value added. I actually don't think that's right. I think, I think ideas are options. And variance is good, and the bad ones just kind of disappear or float around in humanities departments or something. And and the good the good ones are you know the the good ones are are uh, you know held held in in uh, I don't mean that my friends in the humanities I deeply revere you. Um, <laughs> The, uh, uh, the, good ones, the good ones stick around. And I, think, I think that's really right, that, that by throwing a bit of money at uh, various forms of medical research, you get a chance for some, some really game-changing technologies. And again, you know, yes, maybe Paul, if Paul Milgram had worked for a private sector firm, he would have produced something as socially valuable as the Spectrum auction, but it's hard for me to imagine that that would have been the case, that you needed to have someone who was actually thinking about public policy uh, as, as well. And I, I think, you know, it's not like you, you're, it's not like I'm necessarily sure the returns are higher on one side versus the other, but I think the answer of having no public funding of research, that seems to me to be too far, and having a bit, a bit uh, going in that direction seems helpful. In terms of Pell Grants, I think my case is actually stronger, that I don't imagine a world in which all of a sudden eliminating federal funding for education is going to bring jobs back for guys in West Virginia who are currently dealing with the opioid crisis. Does anyone actually believe that, that actually if somehow or other we gutted federal spending for education, that that would make a, a West Virginia an employment power? Paradise? That, that feels so far from the reality to me. Uh, whereas it does seem that occasionally we, we enable people to get out. Now, all that Brian says about, about uh, applying to Harvard if you come from a disadvantaged background, I'm very grateful for the advertisement he did for Harvard's uh, ad admissions department for doing that. It's, it's absolutely true. Um, but I think no matter what system you have that occurs through private competition, entrepreneurship, and philanthropy, and we love that, I think having a little bit of federal intervention that uses tax dollars to provide a bit of extra support to poor people is is uh, is desirable, and that little bit of extra support for poor people is not somehow or other ratcheting up the credentials that everyone occurs. That's being determined by much larger events in the labor market and the demands for skill. Uh, one small Pell Grant program isn't changing that. It's just making sure that a little bit more resources are going for people uh, for people who have a little bit less. And I think overall in this country, having some sense that the federal government occasionally does something which actually is targeted in a not totally crazy way towards poorer people isn't uh, the craziest thing in the world. Now, the final point, which I, I feel far more tentative about, which is this, this state-making, uh, democracy-making point. Um, and I agree that it's, it's a tenuous claim that I'm making. And let me, let me be clear. If I thought it was about the schools inducing ideology 
or the federal government determining ideology, I, I would be totally against it. I actually think that if schools do create citizenship, it's by bringing smart people together and having them try to deal with the problems of making too much noise in the dorm. Or, you know, trying to deal with, you know, how, how, how is it you deal with your cokehead friend who's then has peed all over the guy's, the guy's thing. I mean, this is how democratic action, democratic skills are built uh, on, on the streets. Um, the, uh, the, but the, the, the empirics of this are really pretty strong. So if you ask yourself which of the Warsaw Pact was sort of an artificial thing that kept you know, a whole set of countries in an awful condition uh, for many, many decades, and then it falls apart. And some countries, like Poland and the Czech Republic, turn into reasonably well-functioning democracies, and other, like Kazakhstan, turn into areas that are not. What factor predicts which areas manage to turn over into democracy and which ones don't? Education. Okay? The educated countries of Western Europe manage to do pretty well. The less educated countries do not. Um, uh, across, you know, uh, pretty much along, along any political dimension that you look at, right, education is positively correlated with things. Now, this doesn't mean that the average educated person uh, is all that productive. And I'm sure in the day of George Mason this wasn't true, right? That in fact there were plenty of people who were graduating from uh, William and Mary College who were just into drinking their tankards of ale and going home and racing some donkeys, right? And had nothing to do with anything. But there were a few, there were a few guys who actually imbibed Right, as James Madison did at Princeton University from the Reverend James Witherspoon, the cool, clean thought of the Scottish Enlightenment, right, which was transferred to him and then put into our Constitution. It's hard to imagine how that would have happened without an educational institution that transferred that knowledge. It seems like that pretty much makes the case right there. That in fact, my you know gratitude for the U.S. Constitution for the limits on the overreaching power of the state that you know came to the pen of James Madison from Scotland through James Witherston at Princeton, that feels like I've made the case for at least some subsidy of education uh, without anything more from there. So I think I'll, I'll probably end on that. Um. Uh, I'm going to take moderator's prerogative to ask a couple of questions, but uh, at this stage, formally. Uh, you uh, each have the opportunity to ask each other questions. Uh, you can waive the honor or you can take the opportunity. Uh, uh, Brian, do you have a question you want to put to uh, Ed? Uh, sure. Is this working? Yes, it's okay. working. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, Ed. So actually in the green room we were talking about the economic case for abolition, right? So, you know, the, you know there's a, you know, there's sort of a, an initial view that a lot of economists have that, look, maybe you want to cut a lot, but you don't want to cut all the way down to zero. But then you realize, well, wait a second, if we're going to cut all the way down to 5%, maybe it's worth just going down to zero because those remaining 5% just aren't all that worthwhile. This is the textbook logic of when you want to just shut down your firm entirely rather than reduce your production by 95%. So it seems to me that uh, that actually the, you know, the the economist's idea that economists would just well, economics uh, it go you know, like goes against abolition is wrong. So you know, like so others are like you know, what are conditions under which you would favor abolition of anything, and how is it different from here? So so that's basically a, a fixed cost argument, which is of course a perfectly coherent one. I, I think there are counter arguments in this case. First of all, many of the fixed costs to having these programs have already been paid, right? So they they're not uh, they're they're not ones in which we necessarily would would eliminate. Secondly, you know, having some degree of of public intervention enables us to learn stuff. So you know, when you cut down entirely, it's like the, these famous one arm bandit problems. If I shut the thing down entirely, I've shut off all learning about what the impacts of public interventions are. As long as I have small amounts of stuff going on, I'm continuing to gather some degree of knowledge about how this how this works. And just to give a, a, an example that we were also talking about in the, in the green room, so one of the things that I feel very passionately about is is it's one thing to be pro vocational training. I'm not sure we know how vocational training can actually work well in this country. And I think the critical thing is to have experimental programs outside of school, competitively sourced, tested through randomized control trials that generate the knowledge which is so vital for us to actually figure out how to, how to actually make, you know, make uh, the American workforce more productive, make sure that people who start with less end up with a decent chance to be part of the, part of the, you know, the American economy. Right, and I guess you know, for the other question, so it seems like when you're doing international comparisons, you focus very much on this one variable of education. Whereas I, for example, for the former Soviet Union, would say, look, parts of the, so of the Soviet Union that were more developed before are more developed today. Parts that were more backwards then are more backwards now. So again, it seems to me that actually normally you've got like 10 good things going together. Education is one of them. 
funny. And of course, there's reverse causation and plenty of other stories. So I am puzzled as to why you were so quick to latch on education. I know you were talking about the 1960 results and how, like, you know, education 1960 predicts re predicts results today. But you know, like you know, there's there's this much bigger area of research just on long run persistence, which seems to be weighing here. So what do you say about that? So the the education and growth. I mean, we know that it's it's you know the effects get stronger if we control for initial initial levels of development in terms of the education and growth results. And in terms of the education and democratization results, it's also true that an initial income is not a is not a great predictor of the of the Soviet of uh, the Warsaw Pact countries transferring. But I agree with you that you know it's it's awfully hard. Many things do go together at the at the gross national level. Now, in some sense, I was inspired by your own words, which are such such a big fan of simple transparent statistics, which I, I believe in. And um, uh, you know, in, in most of what what you do in the book, you, you adhere to that perfectly. And then you cite a bunch of papers in macro growth that you know, which you, do, you did not write and are in no sense responsible for, but they do not fit that that you know that definition of simple transparent statistics. And when you do do simple transparent statistics, you get back to something like a pretty high return to education across countries. I say it's transparent for macro, but <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, as we know, macro is a faith based discipline. So, oh. Uh, <laughs> Um, yeah, actually, uh, th that anticipates uh, the question I have that I wanted to mainly put to you, Ed. As far as I understood you, you just said the richer a country gets, the more it spends on education. Uh, richer regions richer, richer regions of the, of the U.S. spend more on education, and richer countries spend more on education, poorer countries spend less. So did you seem to say, well, maybe that's just the causation. It's a luxury good. You're richer, you spend more on it. So the, and that it has no no causality for for uh, for wealth. It's just that when you're rich, you spend more. That's the cause. So so it's yeah. a, a priori. It's not unreasonable. What we yeah. do know and, uh, is that education in 1960, holding income constant or not, predicts subsequent income growth. Income in 1960 does not predict subsequent education growth. Or to make this more tangible, the the nations of East Asia, Taiwan. China, Japan, right, Singapore, all began educating like crazy, investing like crazy in education when they were poor. They are not poor any longer, okay. right? And there's no one who has looked at their growth process and not thought that upgrading of human capital was a serious part of that. Is there, I mean, is there anyone in this room who can actually believe that if, you know, Singapore had kept its level of education as of 1960 or China had as of 1970, that these countries would be anywhere near as rich as they are now? Is there anyone here who actually, can you actually believe that, Brian? Okay, <laughs> go for it. T tell me how with a, with a literacy rate of like 20% you can achieve per capita GDP of $35,000. The, the, uh, the yeah. So, you know, Again, you know, there's years of education and there's actually achieving literacy. So, you know, the actual literacy numbers for most of these countries were already fine in 1970. Yeah, they, they were actually. I, I, right. it's, uh, so, actually, I've got them. Yeah. Let me. Actually, and I think yeah. their numeracy was damn good too. You want me to pull it up? I've got it. Okay. Uh, the, uh, uh, all right, uh, I'll, uh, I'll hold uh, off on the on the. Uh, and the okay. Well, uh, yeah, uh, Brian. Also, uh, if, question of clarification. I think that uh, the sheepskin effect was mentioned a couple of times by Ed and by you. Could you take uh, a, a little bit more time than you did to explain what you mean by the sheepskin effect? Uh, yeah, so I mean, imagine this thought experiment. You're on your way to your last final exam in college and you get in a bike accident, right? And so you miss your final exam, you have a really hard-ass teacher who says, sorry, tough luck, you can't retake the exam. What should you do? So if you think that all that's going on in college is that you're getting paid for skills you acquire, then you should just forget about it. It's no big deal. Just get out of the hospital, get well, and go get your job. On the other hand, if you think that signaling is important, you should be concerned and say, maybe I better go and retake that last class so that I don't uh, spend my whole career with this bad mark on my record. All right, so anyway, so the sheepskin effect is this attempt to measure how much extra payoff do you get for actually crossing, crossing the graduation finish line versus merely doing the individual years. All right, so there is a, you know, at least a, a moderate-sized literature on this. And in the book, I go and try to track down every single paper on this and just take an average. And you know, so the average that I get is that senior year is worth 6.7 times as much as an, as, one of the, as an average year. So basically, if you look at the average value of years one, two, or three, senior year seems to be worth 6.7 ti uh, times that in percentage terms, so ev even, even more extreme. Right? And again, so now it is possible this is just because it's the better students that do wind up finishing. But at least the papers where they put in measures of ability, normally what they find is when you put in measures of ability, it does reduce the value of graduation. But it also reduces estimates of the value of the individual years, leaving the ratio very similar to what I told you. 
Um, do you have a comment on that, Ed? Do you want to sure. No. So, so first of all, we don't. I mean, there surely is signaling involved in the sheepskin. I mean, it's it's, it's almost crazy to to believe uh, that there isn't. A lot of the, crazy the, economists. The, out there. the 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 reasonable <laughs> the, the reasonable third view, which is which is floating around, which I should just emphasize, is that you know education is just correlated with ability, but which doesn't need to be signaling. So meaning that you know you can have a positive correlation between e education and success, even if your ability level is printed on your forehead forever, and it's just more able people are more likely to actually show up and get their diploma, which I think in this case is also quite plausible, that like the guys who are spending three and a half years and not bothering to pick up the, the final one, there's something, there's something uh, wrong about them. And the measures of ability that Brian is talking about, while perfectly reasonable, you know, I I as we know, they're not, they're not capturing many things, which as you say in your book, are things that employers care about, which is not being a total doofus and not bothering to pick up your diploma after three and a half years of tuition paying. Okay. Uh, all right, uh, audience questions. Uh, and uh, again, the usual rule is try to state your question as a question. And uh, I will also be collecting uh, uh, people who are raising their hands. Uh, you have to get uh, over to the mic. Uh, and, uh, and, and don't uh, deliver a speech as a question. And I will be taking questions from our uh, live streaming audience as well. Uh, first question, uh, please, sir, go ahead. Please ask a question. Go ahead. Please ask a question. Uh, we want to direct the question to uh, uh, probably Professor Glazer. Go ahead. Uh, uh, too, too many damn rules out there. Okay, uh, that's uh, no. I, I haven't. I, I don't know. Have you seen? I mean, it's a, it's, it's a fascinating research question. I don't. I don't know the answer to to this. Yes, I mean, all I know is that there's just well, there's only one college that I know of that actually doesn't take the deal, uh, and a bunch of my students teach there, and I'm blanking on the name, which is really embarrassing, but. Yeah, Hillsdale, of course. All right. So as far as I know, Hillsdale is the only college in America that says we won't take your money because we don't want to follow the rules. And it seems like if, it, if, it, like if the costs were really high, there'd be more, but I don't know. You know, uh, just to do a counter example, I was, I, I was kind of happy that there were rules that pushed Harvard to make sure they admit students who are on ROTC. That was actually a rule that was imposed by the by the federal government. That I thought I thought the idea of a bunch of Harvard professors like me acting as if we were superior to people who decided to put themselves in harm's way to protect our country was outrageous. So I was I was really quite pla pleased actually that the that the federal government did that. Um, uh, thank you. Next question. No, 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 yeah, so the, yeah, yeah. 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 The question is really, what is the judgment, and, and do they meet yeah. the standard that education is not in the adjustment? Yeah, yeah. So they do meet the standard. Education is not in the adjustment. I mean, here is so you know, like, you know, so here is the main thing that I would say. The people re do research in this area generally want to find a very large effect of education on national growth, and they struggle to do it, and they don't do it. And to me, this is one of the things that makes research literature credible is if the researchers want answer A and get not A, and they work on it for decades and they still can't get the right answer. All right now, so Lant Pritchett is probably a different story. Right, you know, he's more of a contrarian. Yes, but you know, so you know, the, the main paper that I, that I cite in the book is there's actually one that actually goes and redoes the standard results with all eight known data sets. Those authors' own data set comes up with a higher number, and they say, ah, this is what makes it good. But as far as I can tell, they're the only ones who believe their data set is particularly good. So I mean, like you know, the, you know, there are people who really want the answer to come out high, and they go through eight data sets, and really they you know, they find well, like a couple come up with results that are maybe ha that where the, the national payoff is maybe half for an individual, and every all the other ones are less. So I mean, to me, that's you know, like you know, even when you don't go and actually crack open the box and look at everything they did, which is really hard, of course, that could take decades. But still, if people who want to find a result don't get it, that seems very trustworthy to me. So, so that's that's you know, with all due respect, that's not my interpretation of the of the the 
of the literature. Um, you know, Lance, Lance conversion, which is certainly a conversion of GDP into total fat factor productivity, is 100% using human capital in with a negative sign in the adjustment factor. So something that has human capital with a negative sign and the adjustment factor is being then regressed on human capital, and unsurprisingly, they're, they're finding that coefficient drawn down. I mean, it's also true more generally that, you know, these are asking the question as to whether or not human capital generates higher growth rates rather than just higher levels which is a somewhat different question. And I think if you were asking yourself whether or not is the consensus that human capital always generates higher growth rates, I think Brian is exactly right. There's, there's no consensus on that whatsoever, and that's totally fair. But the levels return, I think it's pretty hard to look at that data and not see that, that, that at least without doing a lot of adjustment, the levels is pretty strong and positive. And again, just the naive, stupid cross-country coefficient is 0.4. Next question. So you know, like I said, right now we pour about $300 billion worth of government money at all levels on the status quo. So a lot of what I would say is let's stop pouring the money and then see what replaces it. Right? You know, there are so many other options. Again, I'll, I'll, I think a big part of it is just the people are going to spend fewer years in school. Right? And that won't look bad anymore when a lot of other people do it. So, you know, like it is, you know, so like it is true that in, early, in earlier decades, people actually just spent fewer, fewer years in school and they were able to get a job right out of high school and then they're signaling to rise to the system. But again, that's a much more socially functional kind of signaling where you, where you show that you actually are able to do the job and you, and you signal through job performance. So I think that's a big part of it. Again, you know, so since this, this uh, debate was only in college, I didn't talk about my other stuff on high school. So, I mean, I'm a high school abolitionist too, or at least, at least government, government funding for it. In fact, uh, yes, in the, you know, so it's not integral to the argument at all, but in the book I do several times say I actually favor full separation of school and state, which I think will make Gene happy, although make Ed even less happy. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, but any, anyway, so, you know, you know, I, you know but like in terms of more moderate reforms, I think just, you know, getting kids that do not like academics to start looking at vocational education when they're in middle school or early in high school would be a bit, uh, you know, another big improvement. Which again, it also provides a signal, but at the same time, it's providing more genuine skill creation. So again, like, really what you want to do from a social point of view is to try to get a twofer, to have people signaling and acquiring useful skills at the same time, right, rather than the system that we got where the two are fairly separate. Brian, who's going to pay for that vocational training? Yeah, well, again, so this is, this is like I said, this is one of my half-may measures. So, yeah, if we're just keeping the, the existing system of, of, uh, of public education, then you're just taking the existing budget and putting it into vocational education. So that's no big problem. But is there, is yeah. there a, given your abolitionist yes. side, is there a dream yes. that you think that somehow yes. that is a private or philanthropic way yeah. that millions of American kids are going to get vocational training that, uh, yeah. without any public yeah. support? Yes. Uh, yeah, so, you know, again, you, know, you, you so, well, it's a uh, Soho Forum. You may have, heard, at least the audience here may have heard about education in Britain and the U.S. in the 19th century and the very high levels of literacy that were achieved before there was significant government money. So, yeah, so, you know, precisely because people get so upset about the idea of poor, ki poor kids not having education, I think that there would be plenty of philanthropic money. Of course, it wouldn't be money for the very wasteful education system we have right now. Again, if you just realize that you know, right now we're spending like 12000 per kid, and yet 30 years ago we were spending a tiny fraction of that, you know, even adjusting for inflation. I don't see why for very poor kids, you, uh, you know, the philanthropy couldn't pay for a much more, much more stripped-down version of education, which, again, is probably a better one anyway because... Back in the old days, kids could play when they weren't do it, doing their studies. Unlike now, where you're being bossed around for eight or nine hours a day. All right, next question. Oh, I, I just think the correlations between education and economic success at the local and national level are, are vastly stronger than, per se, things like, you know, roads and bridges. So I've long been a, a you know, an infrastructure uh, skeptic. Um, I think the case on, on America needing more infrastructure is, is quite debatable. Uh, certainly when we've done things like look at ARA spending, American Recovery and Reinvestment Act spending for infrastructure across areas in the U.S., we've seen very little impact on long-run economic outcomes. Now, that being said, I mean, there is, there is a case for maintenance. So, you know, a little bit of work on potholes ain't the worst thing in the world, given that you've got the stuff. Uh, although in those cases, I see no reason why most road maintenance can't be paid for by users. And, you know, I if you, just to take a more extreme example, the idea that you need any 
federal transfers for things like you know the airport that I'm about to go to is laughable to me. Right, you know, the average person who flies in and out of JFK has in, has an income that's ten times higher than the American average. Why they cannot pay for whatever their infrastructure costs are with landing fees is completely beyond me. So, you know, it's particularly because education has, you know, something of this either the generating the knowledge side, like the spectrum auctions, or you know, it's a way of actually targeting aid that we actually think yields benefits. And remember, Brian has seeded the point that there are at least private benefits for education, right? So, you know, the the poor kids that are benefiting from this are are, are you know we're, we're accepting that they're actually going to get something get something out of this, whereas I'm not seeing any particular benefit to poor kids by having rich kids being able to fly for free on, uh, from, through Kennedy Airport. A quick question for Ed. So if you want to hand out Pell Grants so that poor kids can go to school, should we have some kind of grant so that poor drivers can use the toll roads? It's, it's hard. Probably not. Uh, the, oh, um, <laughs> It's 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 probably. I mean, if you if you told me a story in which you know this was somehow they're going to be crucial for the for the guys getting a job, then conceivably. But most of the time, you want people to pay for the social cost of their actions, uh, and it's you know schooling is a reasonable way to redistribute funding. Giving people the free the free right to pollute and congest is not uh, is not nearly as sensible. Uh, next question. I think you forgot Starbucks, but uh, take it away, Ed. So, so the, it's it's not so relevant what they do now, but rather what they did at the beginning. Now, I've I've heard repeated interviews with Jeff Bezos where he has cited the education of the Seattle workforce as being one of the things when he was in his car that partially determined where he was locating. So I have no idea how to parse what goes on in Jeff Bezos' mind or you know, what, what actually drove his decision relative to dreaming of the Pacific Northwest and the totem poles or something. I, don't, I have no idea what, what was fueling him. But the, the, he certainly has mentioned education in, in, in numerous times. And certainly in the early days, they would not have been recruiting people from far away. They would have been, they would have been hiring people nearby. In the case of, of Bill Gates and, and Microsoft, uh, you know, the very fact that you had someone as, you know, as well trained in is Bill Gates in Seattle to come home to Seattle is a partially reflection of the fact that they had massive computers in Seattle when he was a kid and grew up playing with them. So I think it's, you know, at least it's, it's a defensible line uh, of mine. Is it debatable? Sure. But uh, it is also just true statistically that they literally are on the regression lines. That they literally are doing exactly as well as you would expect they, they should be doing based on their years of schooling. Comment, Brian? Or, uh, uh, sure. So you know, so, you know, you know, Ed mentioned that uh, you know, the social benefits of education seem to be bigger at the regional level, and this is where I say the reverse causation is especially easy because the highly educated people tend to go to the booming areas of the economy. Right? So you know, New York and Seattle and the Bay Area suck up highly educated people from other parts of the country. And here's the thing, if my story is right, that would still happen. Because if my story is right, then the high ability people will tend to go and have a lot of education, which they need in order to show off. And then they will go and take their high ability and, and take it to these areas of the country that are booming. So, you know, I would just say that really, like, both stories would predict basically the same thing. So, so one thing that is slightly different is that, is that the best studies of local wage effects look at migrants. So you're looking at wages before and after you came to the city. So it's not, it's not as if you're just comparing, you know, at a, at a cross-section, the people who are in Seattle with the people who are in uh, Detroit. You're actually saying, you know, when someone comes to Seattle, do their wages go up? And the answer is they do. And, the, and you see them going up not in a single-time wage jump, but, you know, year by year, month by month, they experience faster wage growth, which is sort of compatible with the view that in, you know, in a city like Seattle, people are learning from the people around them, which is the very essence of the human capital externality viewpoint. But I there are also other, other viewpoints which are compatible with the, with the individual ability viewpoint as well. Next question. So I have a question on a lot of money that goes to uh, education, uh, tech education and more. Our education, both our literacy and numeracy rates across the, the world are, to say the least, not, not good. Can both of you speak to the countries that uh, are, 
are in you know the top five or the top ten in terms of literacy and numeracy and what they do in terms of uh, funding education? Yeah, so in terms of the facts, I uh, totally agree with you. So in, in my book, I put a lot of effort into tracking down evidence on what American adults know. Because, you know, the, the standard way that we measure educational outcomes is to give someone a final exam or an, or an exit test. And again, the problem with this, as any psychologist will tell you, is people forget stuff, right? A lot of stuff. In fact, people tend to forget almost everything they don't use after a few years. So anyway, these tests of what American adults know are, you know, like, like to me, are what the, what the real measure of like education's accomplishments are. And yeah, I think so. You know, there's two. There have been two big national tests of American adults' literacy and numeracy, and both of them wind up saying that American adult that maybe about a third of American adults are barely literate and numerate, which seems like a terrible result for a country where we're putting in so much money per year, and we're spending so many years. In terms of other countries, so the U.S. is close to the highest spending per student in the world, right? And I think we're now about average in terms of years that we spend in school for rich, uh, for rich countries. So, you know, I, like, so, you know like in terms of like what other countries are doing better, uh, so, you know, yeah, probably part of it is just their students start out better, honestly. Right? So South Korean students probably start out better than American students. So the day they arrive in school, they're probably, they're probably already doing better in, liter in literacy and numeracy. Uh, in terms of teaching quality, uh, it seems plausible to me they got better teaching quality, although, again, remember Finland, which also does great. They don't even start school till 7, and they don't seem to be very into testing at all, which is pretty amazing. So, yeah, you, now the question is, like, you know, do I think that I could go and improve literacy numeracy if you put me in charge? Then, yeah. All right, which, again, like, mostly just by putting a lot more time on tasks. But when I go and look at the curriculum for K-12 schools in my area, and to see that you're spending over half of your school day on non-academic material, and then realize there's plenty of kids who still can barely read and write. It's like, stop doing that. No art and music until you can read and write. <laughs> like, obviously, like this is crazy to go and have them going and singing a chorus when they can't do, do when they can't add. Uh, but, but here's the thing: I have no optimism that these, that these even very basic proposals will be adopted. Why? Because I've been to parent-teacher night, and I've seen how they think. <laughs> like, if I were to say this, they would just look at me like something they scraped off the bottom of their shoe. Like, this is not, like, they say, oh, I think we could do both. Well, you haven't, <laughs> right? And uh, yeah, so I learned to shut up a long time ago, but yeah. Uh, do you have a comment, Ed? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, uh, we disagree only that I'm, I'm much less tolerant of this stuff than Brian is. So uh, the, uh, um, but I, I can't look at the, the problems of US K through 12 or the places that have been more successful, you know, Singapore, South Korea, uh, and think that the right answer is just to, just to say no. That just doesn't feel at all like the right answer to me. That, <coughs> that maybe there are areas in which we have to do less public, there may be areas in which we need to do more competitive, voucher-provided uh, services of different forms, but I can't look at America and think that the right answer is let's just shut down public funding for education and then everything will be hunky-dory. That just feels completely uh, not right to me, and I don't, I don't think that I can see, see an example in the world where that, that looks right to me. So by all means, let's admit our failings, and Brian's been great on this. Let's you know, question every nonsense assumption that we handle around, and Brian's been great on this, but I don't think the right answer is to give up on a public commitment to trying to actually make sure our children actually learn something. So again, I don't think things will be hunky-dory if you listen to me. I think we'll just stop wasting a ton of money. <laughs> All right. It's very different. So, I mean, I'm, I'm not so... Yeah, they'll, they'll, just build yeah. More, they'll just build more monorails in stupid yeah. places, Brian. That's, uh... that's, just, that's a strange political economy model. I mean, maybe there'll be a few more uh, for stupid monorails, but I think also there'll be some deficit reduction. There'll be some tax reduction. Yeah. You know, they'll probably, you know, the, there'll be some more roads. So, again, like, I will say that when I look at roads, like, even if they're not causing economic growth, at least you can drive. So that's nice. Yeah. You know, and like, and like when, when I see people on, when you, when you build a new road and I look at the drivers, they seem happy. Whereas when I go and look at a class, classroom, the students seem sad. <laughs> so. <laughs> uh, next question. Oh. As a college student, I can attest we're all terrible people. That's besides the point. Um, You're victims, I, not terrible people. Uh, so. I know that a lot of corporations spend a lot of money on education. McDonald's recently uh, is giving out over $100 million per year for sending their employees back to get educated. A lot of companies require MBAs for high-level management positions. This is a question to both you slightly differently. To Ed, um, aren't these examples of private companies covering the cost of education, especially targeting the poor? And to Brian, isn't this a case of corporations 
paying for more education after they already have employees that can see their value at work and saying more education adds more value even after we can already evaluate them so we do not need to have a credential to just measure their value? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. So the easy answer for me is to say MBAs, unlike most of this other stuff, are super useful. However, <laughs> I've talked to way too many MBAs who tell me that's completely wrong. So, so then I've got to come up with another story. And uh, you know, so like whatever you think about this, this is such a this is a small percentage of a small percentage. So I, I wouldn't put too much weight on it. But again, the best story that I've got is that even after uh, you've been working in a firm in a subordinate role, there's still a lot of uncertainty about whether you got the right stuff to, to be management, whether you are management material. And I think that's a lot of what's going on is that they offer these MBA programs to see who has the real ambition, who's really determined to go and do a second job at night in order to rise in this company and who can be offered this deal and just say, I don't feel like it. So I think that you know, there is this, uh, this useful secondary signaling that's going on. But again, maybe the MBA really is teaching useful stuff. It's just that, I mean, which again, I'm very open to, except that everyone I know with firsthand experience says that's wrong. <laughs> you want to comment on the uh, MBA? Sure, it, it was a great question. I, I think that you know, they're both good theoretical reasons and empirical reasons to think that McDonald's educating a few of its workers isn't going to you know, solve America's undereducation problem. Now, it's, it's an example of a case in which firms actually do value skills, and they are willing to, to put some money into it. But you know, many of the benefits of upskilling accrue uh, to the worker, not to the firm, which is a good reason why firms are at least thought to underinvest if they're, if they're the only entities that invest in, in their schooling. And just as a, as a quantitative share, the overall firms paying for uh, education across the country is, is fairly small. That being said, I think you know, I'm all for more engagement with employers to make sure that skill providers are actually doing something that will actually deliver a job, and I think we have a number of examples in which this has yielded relatively positive results. So I think the right answer is, is again, not to trust entirely to employers, but to figure out some, some more hybrid model that uses the, the information created by employers to actually deliver, deliver employable skills. A quick comment on that. So Ed just repeated what I think is Gary Becker's greatest mistake, which is that private employers do not have an incentive to train their workers in general skills because the worker can just take the skills and go someplace else. Uh, that was that would be tr that's true unless employers can have you work for a lower wage when you're being trained, which they totally can. All right. The only exception really is for workers that what would need to earn less than minimum wage. There, for college students, we do have this great loophole where you're allowed to work for free. You can't work for a dollar less than minimum wage, but you can work for free if you're getting training for a college type job. Uh, there's a lot of people who are angry about this and want to apply the minimum wage to the uh, you know to uh, to, uh, to, uh, to uh, interns as well. I say really we, sh we should expand it so that everyone can work for free. And why is it so great to be able to work for free? Because you get something useful, you get actual practical job training. And again, to me, the moral outrage in employers who go and, and don't pay you anything when you're working for them is bizarre given that colleges could charge 70000 a year to go and give you a lot less and people don't complain about that. <laughs> yeah. I think on the policy side, actually, we, we largely agree. I think in terms of just the current, the current status quo, uh, the minimum wage is a, is a binding commitment for, for imp McDonald's employees who are going to be given some extra training. So in fact, there is, there is this lower bound that makes it hard for them to pay for it by getting lower wages. Well, you know, the BLS could just reinterpret its internship or its, in yeah, its unpaid internships rules, which are already a giant loophole that you can drive a truck through. So why not let them drive two trucks through it? Mm. Next question. Uh, uh, yeah. Hi, Brian. I uh, just um, wanted to ask you, how do you disappoint the entire Libertarian Party with only one LEPO? So, sorry, I don't understand. <laughs> how do you disappoint the entire Libertarian Party with only one LEPO? I don't know what a LEPO is. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> My point is, OK, I'm not sure if you got that. G Gary Johnson said he didn't know what a LEPO was either. But um, oh, 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 Alepo, <laughs> Alepo. my point is that currently, unfortunately, I mean, I heard you speak on the Rubin Report about sort of your, your minarchist to anarchist views, and I thought that was really interesting. I think, unfortunately, the Libertarian Party is in kind of a rough spot right now where it's oh, hard to be taken seriously. Um, that's I a final statement. Do you have a question? I do. Oh. I'm getting there, yeah. Please so, so, okay, so my question is, um, I, I've heard you discuss that there's like this idea of the Libertopia where you could, you know, where you'd like to abolish what you're saying. Uh, we, we'd like to, you know, the full abol ab abolition. What I'm interested in is, given the fact that you're saying that 50 to 80 percent is signaling, and there's a lot less, you know, sort of human capital going on. What's the what's the place for sort of uh, taking that and instead of trying to push so much um, st standard education, st standard educational material, just push more social emotional learning um, to to reduce sort of. Uh, Gang violence, violence, tribalism, all these, all these other things that are occurring um, with kids in public school systems. 
I'm sorry to say, Brian, that you're going to have to answer that question in your summary statement because we've run out of time. Uh, to the questions, I know Brian's going to be around signing books and answering questions. Ed, unfortunately, is going to have to go. But we will hear from Ed uh, in terms of his summary. Uh, Ed is the negative, so he goes last. Brian, you go first with your summary, and then perhaps you can answer the question about Aleppo. <laughs> All right, so uh, Ed began by saying that we got the intellectual range from A to B here. I think we more have like the intellectual range from like A to D or maybe even like A to G. Uh, so, uh, you know, so, you know, like the, you know, the additional reason between Ed and I are is actually, I would say, seem to be quite a bit bigger. In a way, actually, if I believe what Ed seems to believe, I would be probably much more pro-education than he is because if it really were true that a year of education were increasing a in national income by 50%, that's a really impressive gain. That's far outside of the realm of almost anything else that's known. Uh, so my guess is that Ed doesn't quite take the estimates as literally as he was saying. Uh, but you know, like, you know, so if you really did think that, then it would seem that he would be quite a bit more different than uh, for me, for me than I am. Again, just going back to the empirical work. You know, you know, like you know, the main thing I can say about that is it's very hard for a layman to go and evaluate the actual quality of the work independently. It's even hard for a researcher. Very often, if you were to go and email the researchers and say, "Please give me all your data and all your work," they'll just say, "I did it 20 years ago. Sorry, the dog ate it. That's it." Uh, but anyway, like the main thing that I can say here in terms of convincingly establishing the reliability of the results I'm telling you is that the researchers didn't want to find these small results, and they found they were. And you, what do people do when they get results they don't want? They try it a different way, and they look around. Is there something wrong with the data? They go scrutinizing. Is there some other way that we could f somehow find it? And in the end, saying, uh, I guess I just had to publish this and like hope someone else finds a mistake." Um, so you know, like you know, so I would say that like out out of people who have actually gone through this, uh, you know, like the people that I could find, uh, you know, like you know, there, there was a very strong consensus that the social benefits of education are a lot less than the private, contrary to what Ed's telling you. And then the main disagreement was about the interpretation. Again, I would say the most popular interpretation is our data sucks and we are looking for better data, right? And furthermore, I actually found that there are you know, a couple of people in print said, we will know when we got the good data based upon whether it gives us a high number, <laughs> right? So I think this does give you an idea about the level of motivated reasoning and the fact that they're not getting it, I think does establish that the result is pretty solid. Uh, on you know, bad ideas being harmless options, uh, hmm, well, there's a whole lot of academic ideas that have, that have worked out very negatively, so I'm not going to blame Ed for Marxism, but it's just worthwhile saying there's a whole lot of universities that <laughs> did promote this stuff, and it did work out very poorly. Uh, and yeah, I'm really not going to blame Ed for Nazism, but Hitler did really well with Nazi, with, well, not Nazi professors, of course, but with you know, German university professors did really well for them. Uh, so again, the, now does this mean that it always works out this way? No, but I think the idea that there's just a lot of poisonous ideas that come out of academia is reasonable. I think again, a lot of the you know, of, you know like you know, a lot of hostility to markets has come out of academia, which you know, I think both Ed and I and most of the audience here will agree is a bad thing. And you know, also very striking that many of the negative ideas can die and then they come back as zombie ideas. So you know, like rent control is a new idea again. Like you might have thought, didn't the '70s and '80s kill it? Yes, and now it's alive again. <laughs> and a good part of this is to, you know, a, you know, a good part of the responsibility does come from not economists at least, but from people at other other social science departments. Let's re let's give this a second look. I found a town somewhere where it didn't seem to destroy everything, so let's let's consider that. Um, yes. Yeah, so again, to repeat, I don't claim that things would be hunky dory. People listen to me, and I don't think that my proposal would revive West Virginia. What I'll say is, if the whole country did it, West Virginia wouldn't get worse and we would save a ton of money, right? And again, that money could be spent on a wide variety of things. Could be spent on libertarian things like tax cuts and deficit reduction, or of course could be spent on all of the other things that people might want to consider. Could be spent on, uh, you know, on you know, increasing transfer payments, or it could be spent on, how about this? How about you know, there is a bonus if you are a young male from a poor family who never goes to jail before the age of 30. You could try something like that. There could be a bonus if you are a young female from a poor family and you don't have a child until you're 25, right? There are a lot of different ways that you could spend this money in a way that would be a lot more fruitful than ones we do if that's what you want to do. Now, I'm enough of a libertarian to say that's not what I think we should be spending the money on. I think we should be focusing on tax cuts and deficit reduction. But again, if you are concerned about the things that Ed's concerned with, there's still no reason not to go full abolition, 
uh, for education spend uh, for uh, for, uh, for higher education spending and think about a much more constructive way of spending the money. So I will stop there. Thanks a lot. So Brian is probably right. There's probably a little bit more distance than I, than I suggested. But uh, and I think the largest point of, dif of distance is that you know, no matter how much you think that we should cut, and uh, I'm certainly on board with cutting a fair amount, there is still a vital need to make education in this country better. There is a vital need to in invest in smarter ways of doing schooling, both for kids, for vocational training for teenagers, and at the higher ed level. There's a need for improving the quality of, of research funding that we do. All of this is first stage on the agenda. And I think in most of the cases, the social returns just for us as thinkers are at least as high for trying to contribute on how to make, how to make education better rather than just how to cut education. I, I will make this point larger for the country as well, that I think very often we end up in this country in a very you know, facile debate about more government versus less government. There's no question on that debate, I'm on the less government side of it. But I always think that you know, the harder question, and in some sense the more important question, is how the heck are we gonna get better government? And in the case of schools, I think that requirement is absolutely paramount. Because in fact, when our schools fail, they fail our children, and indeed they fail our country. And you don't need to believe a 42% national return to, to a year of schooling, which I certainly do not believe, right? My point was just, in fact, that when you do the simple, naive thing, you don't get something that's small, you get something that's huge. Um, but you know, that type of thing, at least, makes me think that caring about education is important. Now, the second point, which is about bad ideas. Yes, there are bad ideas that are absolutely catastrophic. Marx was not a university professor, to be clear. Um, and indeed, there's a certain sense in which I'm gonna, gonna uh, resort to Brian's own book, which is that the university system you know, is far more likely to create indifferent mediocrity than enormously powerful evil. Okay, enormously powerful evil doesn't typically get tenure, it doesn't get through peer review, it doesn't, you know, whereas indifferent mediocrity, that's perfect for those, those, bar, uh, those barriers. Um, so uh, the, um, the, the, you know, the, the point being that in fact, uh, I think most of the ideas that are bad that actually come out of the university are, are fairly, fairly indifferent, can be jettisoned. And in fact, even the rent control point, that's really not a university idea. That comes out of housing advocates in, in New York in the first part of the, the 20th century. And there are some academics who favor it, but overall the big supporters of rent control are people who have rented units and who want the prices to be cut down. And, and it's, not, it's not particularly uh, tricky to, to get to that. Um, just, just ending on, uh, you know, I, I think I actually want to end on a, on a slightly different note, which is, um, yeah, we've been making a lot of fun of colleges and universities, and I think there's plenty to make fun of. But I, I will say, actually, that I feel extraordinarily privileged to teach the students that I teach. And I actually feel extraordinarily pri privileged to be part of the teaching relationship that I am, I am in with them and the fact that I learn from them all the time. So um, I, I, you know, I just feel required to say this. I'm not making a public policy statement that comes out of that. But personally, I just wanted to make it clear, given that this argument has been, and you know, and I will make fun of many things about Harvard uh, forever, and much of Harvard deserves to be made fun of. But I don't think the students do. Both the graduate students that I feel extraordinarily lucky to, to work with, to learn from, to collaborate with on the research process, and the undergraduates who I feel extraordinarily privileged to teach uh, and to work with, that has been an incredible blessing uh, in my life. And I think I would be remiss to leave the stage without giving, giving the, the impression of that, of that sense of gratitude. So um, let me just end there uh, by, but, you know, and, and just say that you know, this, this kind of argument, this kind of debate, this kind of thing is absolutely vital for the future of the Republic. And you know, Brian Kaplan is wonderful in his willingness to charge into things that you know people people throw stuff at him for. And you know, we need a whole lot more of that. And the fact that I take away the answer as being I, I want to, I'm happy cutting a whole bunch of educational spending, but I want to spend at least as much effort on trying to make education uh, education better. Uh, without eliminating all public role doesn't mean that I'm not very grateful and very respectful for what Brian has contributed. And I, I'm grateful to all of you for being here as well. So thank you. Okay, we are now going to open the final vote on the resolution. Uh, all government support of higher education should be abolished. Uh, Jane Menton uh, is in the front row. She's going to be monitoring the vote. Uh, I uh, do want to say uh, whatever the voting happens, you both won. You were both brilliant, <laughs> informative, and most important, very entertaining and witty. And uh, so I want to thank you We're both. all winners. Yeah. <laughs> 
I want to thank you both, uh, both Ed Glazer and Brian Kaplan. Uh, Ed, again, unfortunately, is going to have to go, uh, but uh, Brian's going to be around to, uh, to sign books and uh, to, to talk a little bit more about why he disagrees with Ed. Uh, <laughs> and then... Uh, <laughs> He's going to let it really hang out. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. The good stuff is going to start as soon as Ed leaves. And then uh, uh, now I want to remind you that on Monday, June 11th, we're going to have another couple of professors, in this case, Georgetown law professor Randy Barnett, defending the resolution, the U.S. Constitution should be interpreted and applied according to the original meaning communicated to the public by the words of the text against Cornell law professor Michael Dorff, and the guest moderator will be Judge Andrew Napolitano. And uh, Ed, Ed and Brian, you have lifetime passes to future events of the Soul Forum. So that's part of the reward for uh, putting up with the us. And uh, so please come. Uh, as you probably know, we are, we are at the point where we seem to sell out every event very quickly. Uh, and uh, we're raising our prices a bit. It's still, bear in mind, it's about the price of a movie. And on top of that, you get free food, you get lively entertainment. It's a bargain, uh, even at twice the price. Uh, but so I do recommend that uh, you buy your tickets for the June 11th event, uh, because in a few days, we will probably hike the price, because we don't want the scalpers uh, to profit too much <laughs> from, from our events. Uh, the, um, the July 2nd, we were already sold out. I told Brian, of course, the Bitcoin debate is sold out. And Brian, of course, said, what else is new? Bitcoin is always going to sell out. And that's going to be... That's going to be Eric Voorhees. Uh, but also, we're going to ask, we're asking people who, who, who uh, have tickets uh, if they want to switch to another event, because we've got eight more uh, debates starting in September. And then we are able to accommodate the wait list people, which we'd like to do. Uh, Jane, how are we doing on the voting? It looks like we're closing the voting. So please uh, bring the results uh, to us, to me. Oh, yeah. No, that's all right. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, the yes votes were 50.5%. Uh, See, Brian, you started with 50.5%, and you went to 63%, so you picked up 12.6 percentage points. Ed was at 25%, and he stayed at 25%. So looks like you win the Tootsie Roll. Thank you.